Hi, I'm Nate Eaton, and joining me now is Joseph Scott Morgan. He was the senior investigator for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office in Atlanta, Georgia. He managed how many on your staff, Joseph Scott? 11 or 12? Uh, yeah, about 11. Yeah. yeah. And, my, and, and myself, which is a handful in and of itself. So <laughs> Right. Um, so he has experience uh, investigating death. He is also the host of Body Bags, a podcast that you can listen to. And he's written at least one or two books. So he knows forensics. And that's why I wanted to chat with him today about the information that came out with uh, Lori and Chad uh, over the past few days. So Joseph Scott, we know that uh, the prosecutor wants to do consumptive DNA testing on a few items uh, associated with the case. First of all, what does consumptive DNA testing mean? <laughs> well, when you hear the term, uh, it sounds kind of passive when you first hear it. And then all of a sudden uh, you, you come to the realization that everything, and I mean everything, will be consumed. Any kind of sample that's there. So it's, you're swinging for the fence, essentially, uh, to get everything that you possibly can in one fell swoop. Um, and it's, it's important to understand that this is the state's evidence. It's the state's case. And so, you know, I think that the defense has had this opportunity to come to the realization that, um, they've got to do something if they if they want to have a hand in this if they want to be able to observe the testing the certainly the collection um and that can create a problem you know when you're in a lab uh like this and i've worked in environments certainly in the morgue i've had you know i've been present for autopsies where you have an individual that is being accused of something where they have represented if they have enough money they have representatives there to view the autopsy as the autopsy is being conducted by the state, but it strikes me as odd. And I, I know I'm going a bit of far field here, but this is kind of odd that, that people would say, well, the evidence needs to be removed from the state crime lab and taken somewhere else to be tested. Well, how are you going to vet that? I mean, that kind of sets this weird precedent where, okay, well, I want my evidence taken somewhere else as well. So I, I just don't see that happening. Yeah, and, and you're you're talking about the there was an affidavit attached to this uh, motion from the prosecution where yeah. uh, the crime forensic manager said, you know, we don't where the policy doesn't allow us to have people observe um, these type of things, and if bringing a video camera in could contaminate the DNA. I guess if maybe the prosecution and the defense could agree on a third yeah. party. Um, but one can understand why the defense would want to be in there because once the DNA is gone, yeah. it's not. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's a, I think it's a reasonable request to ask that a third party observer be there because, you know, we talk about chain of custody all the time, don't we? And, uh, maintaining the continuity of evidence. Um, it has to be guaranteed and you, you want as few hands on it as possible. So you, you maintain, the pristine nature of it. So that's critical because the next thing you know, you spoiled a sample. And if they are using consumptive testing, this is very important. Uh, that means that the evidence that they have is so very minuscule. It's so very tiny that, <laughs> that there is a chance that it, it literally cannot be divided you know, and split and say, well, you know, we'll save this or we'll hold this back or whatever the case. It, it just might be one of these issues. You know, they, they're talking about hair, I think came up, um, you know, relative to the tape um, in, in JJ. Um, well, hair doesn't necessarily mean plural. It might be singular hair and we don't know what the nature of that hair is. Does the hair have a bulb on it? Well, if it has a bulb, then that's a different type of DNA sequencing that's much more robust. If it's simply a shaft, that means that they're going to have to do mitochondrial DNA, uh, which is, it's accurate, but it's not, you know, it's not as um, uh, desirable as say, if you had the root bulb. Um, then you think about these fingerprints. I, I don't, you know, I don't really know what that means. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that with the fingerprints, they've taken, you know, the tape, and more than likely in the, in the adhesive uh, contact surface, they've left behind what we refer to many times as a plastic print. It's different than a standard latent print where you leave a, uh, uh, 
a fatty lipid print behind, like we all have kind of this greasy uh, 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 residue on our on the tips of our fingers that leave a print behind. We don't have fingerprints here. These are friction ridges. We leave a print behind. Mm -hmm. And so, but this is different. If it's in the adhesive, that means that it's, it's actually making an imp imprinted area there. And when the hand is peeled away, you can still see this image. Well, what do you have to do in order to get to that print without destroying it and be able to read it? That's going to be key. Are they going to use alternative lighting sources so that they don't destroy it? What's really intriguing for me are the tools. Um, you know, they, with the pickaxe, which is horrible to think about, you know, all of this is horrible. God bless them. It's just terrible stuff. But you think about the pickaxe, the handle of the pickaxe, and then you have the handle of the shovel. And they're talking about these non-specific spots, these dark spots. Well, we don't even know what those dark spots are. They're just calling them spots. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know that they're blood. It could be anything. And you can look at it and say, well, I know blood. No, you don't. Not from... Not, not in the way it matters to the court. There's a whole series of testing you have to get to. So if you take that sample of that unknown dark spot and test it, you have to verify that it is in fact blood. Then is it human blood? Then if it is human blood, whose blood, whose blood is, or what's the typing of the blood, ABO yeah. typing? And then you get to DNA. So all those things can destroy sample. So that's, I think that that's kind of what we're getting at with this. Sure. Just, just and obviously- thinking, one of the things too, they're saying um, some stuff from underneath JJ's fingernail yeah. on one of his hands. I would imagine that's got to be tiny. What what do you think they could be looking for there? Well, it's um, look. Uh, you know, I I come from a rural area of the country. Like I, I know where you are, that beautiful area that you guys are in. And when you think about in the spring where you have an unplowed field, this is the way I teach my students. You think about an unplowed field where it's just, you know, just dirt. The, the farmer goes out, he puts the plow to the dirt. And prior to that, you don't have furrows in the dirt. But when he drags those discs across there and makes those furrows, it's the same way if you have a pristine spot of skin, say on an attacker's neck or on the face, you reach up and it's a primal response when you're being attacked, even for a little boy, throw his hands up, try to defend himself and scratch like this. So if all of the viewers will look at the leading edge of their fingernails, um, they're, they're kind of elliptical in shape. They act like the tines on those plows. And when you scratch like this, you collect trace evidence beneath that leading edge. Now, what can that be? Well, you can have hair and you can have tissue, you can have blood. And, uh, you know, we talk about touch DNA and that sort of thing. Well, if you're sloughing skin cells, that's gonna show up in underneath those nails. And one of the things that happens at autopsy, remember JJ's remains were, I'm not gonna say pristine because obviously he's he's been down. Sure. And, uh, I'm sorry to say that, but he has been. But compared to Tylee, you're talking about fragmented remains. With him, though, they were able to examine his fingernails. And at autopsy on many, many cases, what we'll do are called nail scrapings and nail, uh, nail clippings. And so you take a wooden, uh, people have seen a cuticle, a cuticle stick where they push their cuticles back. Sure. It's very similar to that. And you scrape beneath the nail and you collect in a uh, it's almost like a druggist paper, like we're uh, a drug, like a drug fold that'll fall in there. And then afterwards you take a sterile set of, of nail clippers and you clip the nails just to make sure that you have everything. All of that is collected. And then that's sent to the state crime lab. I don't know hmm. Nate, what they've identified in there. And yeah. that's, that can be quite specific. Again, his body was down long enough so that some of these biological samples beneath his nails um, could be degraded. Who knows? You know, uh, who, who knows? Well, and if uh, the other thing is he, they say that he was killed in September, the body was found in June. I don't know. We have harsh winters here, so he it could have been preserved. I, I guess we'll see. Joseph Scott, how long does an autopsy normally take? Hmm. Like to conduct it? Yeah, well, okay. Let's just say that we have we're not talking about this case at all. Yeah, we're just in general. A standard autopsy. If it's a non-complicated autopsy where you're not talking about multiple stab wounds, gunshot wounds, that sort of thing, 
from beginning to end, uh, generally hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes or so to get the, uh, the physical autopsy done. And that's the complete external and internal examination. Also couple that with most of the time nowadays, they'll do x-rays as well, post-mortem x-rays and the blood draws, fluid draws. And it's, if you work in a big shop, um, like over in Ada, uh, Ada, uh, Ada County, um, they, they, they're busy, you know, they're busy. So it, you get into a routine, but there are multiple variable variables dependent upon uh, how complicated the case is. But for a standard case, it, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to take you over two hours to get this okay. done. And a lot of it's dependent upon the pathologist that's doing the case. And I'm sure that this DNA evidence they want, would it have even been possible 20, 30 years ago? I, I mean, has technology changed leaps, at all? Leaps, leaps and bounds, mate. Leaps and bounds. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here now uh, looking back in the rearview mirror at my career and the things that we do now are, it's a wonderment to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I know a lot of old timers probably say that about any field that they're in. But, you know, I look back and I think about how far we've come. Because even when, when I started um, back in the early 80s, you know, essentially, yeah, we knew about DNA, but it was just something that some guy who wound up, you know, winning the Nobel Prize over in England had uh, Sir Alec Jeffries had kind of come up with and had actually put into practice in a case over there. We didn't, we didn't see that, you know, all we had was ABO groupings, you know, to do blood. And that's not very narrow, you know, when you, it's very broad spectrum stuff. And, you know, you're, you're thinking about like the rarest blood type in the world is a B pause. And I don't know. It's like, I, I know I'm going to, I know somebody's going to skewer me for this. I think it's like one in a, in 250 people have it or something. But when you, you compare that to what we're talking about with DNA, we're talking about numbers in the millions, billions, trillions, um, it's astronomical. And so I, I can only imagine what, you know, two or three generations down, down the tracks are going to see. Yeah. It's going to be quite amazing stuff. Well, thank you very much, Joseph Scott Morgan.